Hello, everybody. Future Bryce here. I just edited this video for you guys. And just FYI, around uh, the middle of the video, some of the audio goes a little bit wonky. Um, it's only for a little bit, though. So hopefully it won't be too bad for you guys. Our internet has been a little unstable, um, unstable since the hurricane. So I apologize, but it doesn't last that long. Just giving you a heads up. Anyway, please enjoy the show. Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Desperate times do indeed often call for desperate measures. Have you ever wanted something so bad that you're willing to do anything to make your dreams come true? Well, this happens a lot with women and fertility, for women who want to be pregnant but have a hard time getting pregnant. Now, a few weeks ago when we were speaking about Gypsy Rose Blanchard, I did talk about some spell casty witchy stuff women down here in the South often do in order to get pregnant, but it got me thinking about other superstitions around the world involving infertility. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a great big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. If you would like to help support this channel by joining our patron or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta, and today on Mystery Monday, we're going to be talking about the statue of Victor Noir. Now, of course, there's probably going to be a big debate over superstition and or witchcraft. Some people think that superstitions work because the person believes it works. And if you believe it works, then it will work. What is it that Henry Ford said? Whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Other people believe that witchcraft and superstition works because it's magic and it just works whether you believe it or not. Now, in my opinion, both are true right? Like we are magic as human beings. So if we truly believe something works and our mind is what's making it work, then that's just as magical than the act of the craft itself, if that makes sense. But this whole story with Victor Noir is so unbelievably fascinating to me because out of all the research I did on this particular superstition, it does seem to work. It seems that there are a lot of women who go and visit this statue that do end up getting pregnant within a year or find a husband within a year of visiting this said statue. We're going to get into the story of Victor Noir and how his statue came to be the symbol of fertility. But before we get into it, before I forget, I want to ask you in the audience if you've actually seen this statue and if you have had an experience with Victor Noir's legend his superstition of getting knocked up by visiting it it's definitely part of the world of the weird and the wacky and I am totally here for it now before we get into the story of Victor Noir and his famous fertility statue I do want to take a moment to give a brief shout out to our one of our sponsors Gnostic TV and our panel of occult survivors over on Gnostic TV. So hold on for one second for a brief commercial. 
One of our awesome sponsors here on Esoteric Atlanta is Gnostic TV. As many of you know, I am also a content creator for Gnostic TV. I have two series, the Esoteric Explorer series, along with Esoteric Health and Wellness. Over on the Esoteric Explorer series, you can join me for deep dives into the weird and wacky and folklore exclusive folklore stories that are only found over on Gnostic TV. You could also join me over on the health and wellness series where we go into the spiritual and esoteric implications of exercise and health. But we also have a brand new panel over on Gnostic TV called Tales of Survival of the Dark Side. This is for people who are particularly interested in the occult. On this panel, we have a ton of people who are speaking about their experiences growing up in occult families. Now, because of the nature of this conversation, obviously it has to be on a separate platform, which is why we're doing this over on Gnostic TV. If you would like to specifically watch the panel of occult survivors, there is a link to ticket sales down in the description box below. Once you buy your ticket, your ticket is good for forever. You can always come back and rewatch or continue to watch the stories of these people who have survived these particular satanic families. Now, as always, a percentage of the ticket sales go does go to support these whistleblowers. So please know that your money is going to a really great cause. Otherwise, you're welcome to watch the Esoteric Explorer series and the Esoteric Health and Wellness series exclusively on Gnostic TV. Now, the Victor Noir statue, this scandalous statue, is located in the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. Now, this is a very, very famous cemetery. It's a very big cemetery. And there are a lot of famous people that are living at the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery. Like Jim Morrison is there. There's a lot of famous ghosts haunting this area. And I will totally do a deeper deep dive into the cemetery and some of the stories around this cemetery if you guys want me to. Because you guys know, you know I like a good spooky wooky story. You know I like a good, a good haunting. So if that's something you guys want, let me know again in the comment section below. I'm probably going to do it anyway because I'm interested in this place. And I'm not going to lie, even though I'm not looking to get pregnant, um, I definitely, next time I'm in Paris, I will definitely be visiting this statue because I find this story so freaking interesting. And it, it is kind of scandalous. Like when we get into like what people are doing to this statue in order to fulfill their fantasies of, of being a mama, um, it's kind of scandalous. And I love it. I'm totally here for it because that is, this is one of the most beautiful thing about humanity to me. Like we talk a lot on this. I mean, this whole channel was founded again on the eccentricities of the South. That fact that down here in the South, we're going to church on Sunday and we're pulling tarot cards on Sunday night. We all got voodoo mumbas and we all practice a little bit of witchcraft. It's just part of the culture down here. And again, this wackiness, this weird stuff is what makes humanity so precious. So the fact that all over the world, these like crazy superstitions exist just makes me fall even more in love with our own species. And uh, the fact that women in Paris are still, and probably from all over the world, are traveling to this specific cemetery just to try to become mothers is is just, I just love it. You know, as, as, as many PhDs and, and, and master's degrees we can all have, we still, we still like a little woo-woo. We still like a little superstition and, and urban legends, don't we? And so let's get into this story of Victor Noir. Now, unfortunately, I, there are some missing pieces in the story for me personally, and I have a lot of questions about Victor Noir himself, the, the who the, this person was. And unfortunately, I don't speak French. I have studied French, but you know, I'm from the South again. So the closest thing to French that I recognize is Creole, which is definitely not standard French. And so again, I would love for you, if you are a French speaker, or if you do know more about Victor Noir, I would love for you to fill in the blanks down in the comment section below, because 
I'm curious as to how he became the symbol of fertility because I can't find any type of 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 sign or um you know when he was alive that would make him be like this god of impregnating people I don't know you know like he just seemed like an average guy that got stuck in a really weird situation historically in France that's how he lost his life and then his grave his statue on his grave ended up taking on this life of its own. So I would love for you to help me fill in the blanks with that. But for people who don't know who Victor Noir was, now this was his pen name. He was this French journalist and he did not have a long life. He actually departed this earth at like 21 years old and he didn't depart himself. He got unalived by Prince Pierre Bonaparte. Prince Pierre Bonaparte you got that right. He was the nephew of Na the Napoleon Bonaparte. And at the time that this whole fiasco happened, the unaliving of Victor Noir happened when Napoleon III was the emperor of France. So Pierre, Prince Pierre Bonaparte was the nephew of Napoleon and the cousin of Napoleon III. So they were like the ruling family. And so there's a lot going on in the story that very much mirrors what's happening in our world right now. So what we know about Victor de Noir, he was a French journalist. And again, Victor Noir was his pen name. He was born on the 27th of July, 1848. And he was unalived on the 11th of January, 1870. So let's get into it. I'm going to try my best to explain this. Again, I am not a French speaker. Um, and so I apologize if I am pronouncing some of this incorrect. Blame it on the Creole. Blame it on, on, on being an English speaker. But nonetheless, here we are. So at this time in France, just like today, there was a lot of instability in the country because of the government. Right now, if you're following along with our PESOR series, which I still have more work to do on that. Again, apologies with the hurricanes. Things got a little bit hel hel helter skelter, but nonetheless, we're getting back to our schedule. But if you were following along with the PESOR series, we know that there is this conspiracy that this kid named Daniel, who took on the last name Pesor, was sent to the United States. He was actually the son of Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth, and before. When they met there, had their date at the guillotine, um, the, the people like snuck the little boy out and basically got him to the United States, raising him in North Carolina in order to protect the French rail line because of the fiasco of the French Revolution and of course the fiasco of the Catholic. And in fact, the fact that as legend states that this Daniel kid and even ended up in North Carolina and was taken out of Europe was because Napoleon found out about him. That's all part of this conspiracy. But with all that being said, there was just a lot of tension. There was a lot of stuff going on in France. And as I have said many times before, no one throws a revolution quite like the French. Now, the French have not been as successful as other countries. I mean, in America, we just kind of like threw the tea in the ocean and then had a revolution. They literally start chopping heads, right? So so I am very in awe, much in awe of, of how, how the French go about their revolution. But nonetheless, at this time of Napoleon, we, we kind of it kind of appears as if France went from like one ruling family to another. Right. Like maybe they thought Napoleon was going to come in and bring some sort of diplomacy, some sort of like different style of government. But he literally like crowned himself the emperor. So not it kind of went from, again, the bourbon house to like the Bonaparte house basically is what ended up happening. So, again, there's a lot of, of, of frustration. There's a lot of friction amongst the people of France. Now, of course, at this time in the 19th century, duh, there was no television, there was no social media, there was no like radio. Most of the news was told through the newspapers. Now, we know now sometimes that uh, the mainstream cannot be super trusted. 
But back then, the newspapers were kind of the only way that people really knew what was going on in, in their world. And, and just like today, they had more left-leaning newspapers and more right-leaning newspapers. Now, what's interesting, and I think very, very insightful, especially for the Americans who are listening, the more liberal-based newspaper were based on Republican ideals. And I have said this in my own personal life that we're starting to see in our own world today that those who claim to be liberal are actually not. They're more, don't know what words I can say on YouTube, but more like Stalin-esque, Yahtzee will say-esque, whereas the Republican values are more of like the liberal, like just live and let live, like let people be let people know, let less government control. So I wanted to clear that right away. So we talk about these warring, these dueling newspapers uh, covering the political landscape of France at the time. What you might consider to be leftist leaning newspapers are actually more Republican values versus the right leaning, which is more Democrat, we'll say as an American, for the Americans. I know they're not called Democrats in other countries, but just to kind of, we can start to kind of untangle this web of confusion. So basically what happened, Victor Noir worked as a journalist for this extremely liberal newspaper. And there were these other, so we got three newspapers involved in this story. There were these two newspapers that were kind of warring with each other. They were kind of releasing different articles, bashing each other. Like one, the more liberal newspaper was bashing the emperor and the control that the Bonapartes had on the country. Whereas the more right-leaning paper was like protecting the emperor. And they were just kind of having this media war, kind of like Fox News and CNN, right? They were just kind of having having this like media war. Well, Pierre Bonaparte, so Prince Pierre po Bonaparte ended up writing a letter to the right-leaning newspaper, basically defending his family. Not only did Prince Pierre Bonaparte defend his family, his uncle and his cousin, but he also called the people that worked for the more left-leaning newspaper beggars and traitors. Yes, he went there. I mean, spoken like the left today, like as they've been flipped, right? Like the more controlly group calls us all names. People that want freedom calls us names. That's what he was doing too. Does that make sense? I'm trying to be careful how I say this on YouTube. I think you guys get what I'm saying though. Like, not much has changed, right? He's calling, not only is he just defending his stance that he believes his family are, they're good at their job and they're emperors and they're ruling France, but he's also taking that extra step to like basically try to annihilate the opposing side by calling them names like beggars and traitors. Like, oh, you peasants, you're traitors to your country because you won't support the emperor. You won't support the ruling government. So you're just a traitor and you ain't nothing but a beggar and a peasant, you poor, poor people. All right. So this is happening between these two newspapers. Then this third newspaper and I'm not even going to try to say the names of these newspapers, guys. I have way too much respect for France to try to say the names of these newspapers. So this other newspaper over here and this other third newspaper, this was the newspaper that Victor Noir worked for. And this third newspaper that got involved, that entered the chat, was even more liberal, more Republican than the original liberal Republican newspaper that Prince Pierre Bonaparte dist does that make sense are y'all following along i mean this is some hot spicy tea some total gossip about the past okay so the third newspaper the more liberal one basically called pierre bonaparte out and was like what are you doing dude you you can't come in here and call us names we're your constituents we're, we're the people that your family is impering. We're the peasants that you're now messing with. Do you remember the guillotine? What are you doing? So the third newspaper comes in to defend the less liberal newspaper that was originally calling him out. So then Pierre 
once again sends a letter back to the right-leaning newspaper basically saying i said what i said now just to give you guys the span of time this whole drama happened it started in december of 1869 and it ended of J january of 1870 so this was some drama this was some major major tabloid drama but instead of bickering women it was bickering men so let's review two newspapers in eight uh, in december of 1869 two newspapers one more controlly one more liberal are going at it the controlly newspaper the right-leaning newspaper is in 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 favor of the Bonapartes, of them being the emperor, of their loyalist, royalist, whatever you want to say. They wanted the establishment. They loved the establishment. So even though they're more right-leaning newspaper, they're more like CNN today, right? MSNBC. They love them some enslavement. They love them some leaders, some Alumashmati. They just love it, right? And you got this other newspaper that's more liberal or more Republican that's like, actually... I think human beings should not be enslaved and should probably be able to self-govern, right? We're less than 100 years out from the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution. We've gone through the French Revolution. And so these newspapers are bickering back and forth about how to govern France. Prince Pierre Bonaparte writes a letter calling the people and the more Republican. So he basically writes a letter to what would be CNN bashing Fox News if that makes sense. Like these stupid peasants, I can't believe they would ever even think to question the emperor and the government. How dare you question the government, you heretics? Like, how dare you? You're the lowest of low, the scummiest of scummiest. And so that's happening. Then this other newspaper over here, that would be more like the back channels, today that are like screw this everyone should be free they come in and call prince pierre bonaparte out for doing this for writing this ridiculous letter and then prince pierre bonaparte writes back and basically says i said what i said i believe what i believe and this all happens in the matter of a few weeks from december of 1869 to january of 1870 so just in a few weeks this whole this whole saga happens and so to work it out, to work it out, as you do in the 19th century, they decide to have a duel. You heard me right. It's not just in the United States West that they had duels. They're doing this in France, too. They're going to have a freaking duel. Like, to be a fly on the wall. Like, I, I, maybe we should bring dueling back. I don't know. Maybe there's something to be said about this particular practice. So the editors, he's challenged the editors of these two newspapers to a duel. So these editors send Victor Noir, a journalist, and a colleague to go meet with Prince Pierre Bonaparte to basically establish the rules of the duel. This was on the 10th of January, 1870. I'm telling you guys, like, this was just a matter of weeks that this whole shenanigans happened. So Victor Noir and his colleagues show up to, to have conversations, to plan this duel out. Now, it turns out that Victor Noir and his colleague also had on them, which was doesn't seem shocking. Like, I think back in those days, more people carried these around with them. But I guess the French, the, the, the Prince Pierre Bonaparte, I guess he kind of saw that as like a threat, so quote unquote. He basically started to call the guy's names like he could not believe he was such an elitist, such an entitled little shit that he could not believe that the editors of these newspapers sent employees, assistants, journalists, basically, to schedule and plan out this duel. Like he thought it was so beneath him to actually the Prince Pierre Bonaparte, like how dare they, how dare these peasants send their assistants to me, Prince Pierre Bonaparte, to plan this duel. And so as the story goes, apparently, Prince Pierre Bonaparte, we really only have his word for it, started to call these editors even more vile names. Now, that part, 
a point, Victor Noir stood up and said, hey, not cool, man. We're here to plan the duel. We're going to settle this like men in a duel. Don't call my my boss names. And then apparently Prince Pierre Bonaparte slapped Victor Noir, just slapped him, and then pulled out his thingy and to Victor Noir. Well, well, my friends, Prince Pierre Bonaparte was in fact arrested for unaliving this man. However, he claimed self-defense. He claimed that Victor Noir actually attacked him. And if attacked, he mean just stood up for his friends and said, hey, not cool, bro. And so therefore, Prince Pierre Bonaparte was exonerated. Now, this pissed the people off so much. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I guess we can because we're seeing that would be like, I mean, we're seeing this here. I can't say too much like you guys know because we're on this platform, but we see this injustice all the time nowadays with the establishment with the Aluma Shmati, right? Where they just get away with everything. And it's so obvious, like they're not even trying to hide it anymore. And that's kind of the same feeling through my research of what was happening in this court case. Like the people were shooketh. They were shooketh that this dude that blatantly unalived Victor Noir, a 21 year old journalist, a kid, literally has gotten away with it. Like literally just got away with schmurder. So they're pissed. So the day after the 12th of January, there was a huge political revolt. They had people protesting. So many people took to the streets to protest this whole situation. And again, I'll say it for the people in the back who didn't hear, no one revolutions like the French do. I would have been terrified if I were a Bonaparte at this point. I would have been shaking in my boots. If I were the judge, the attorneys, any type of government agency, I would have been like scared shitless at this point because the French have proven that they take their revolutions very, very seriously. Now, they, they had all these political activists really using this story as a way to further their point that the establishment of the Bonaparte were corrupt. In fact, it was a civic duty. This is their words, a civic duty to the Republicans to not let this go. And boy, they didn't. They surely didn't, because on September 4th of 1870, so just a few months later, the Bonapartes were overthrown and the Franco-Prussian War broke out. Now, this again was 1870. It wouldn't be for another 21 years until um, Victor Noir's body was moved from its original burial place to the Pierre Lachey Cemetery, the very famous cemetery that I started with. Now, again, the statue that I'm referring to that's supposed to be like help you with your infertility of Victor Noir is basically his grave, you guys. So there was a very famous artist in France at this time. And this was a man by the name of Jules Dalou. I hope I'm saying his name right. He was born on the 31st of December, 1838. So he was about 10 years older than Victor Noir. And in 1891, when Victor Noir's body was moved to Pierre Lachey Cemetery, this Jules was commissioned to do his statue, like an installation of him over his grave. And the statue that he created basically was of Victor Noir the moment after he was, so he's like laying on the ground, right? Like he's, he's like laying on the ground. He's literally just been unalive. Now I find Jules Dalou very interesting as well because he is also a huge political figure in French history. He was born into a working class Republican 
Huguenot family. So he grew up with these uh, these crazy ideas of, of self governess so much so that he actually went to England to be in exile for like eight years. And it wasn't until after uh, the Bonapartes were kicked off the throne that this artist was actually allowed to come back to France. So the artist that they picked to create this statue, this installation on top of Victor Noir's grave, again, super, super important to the overall story of this particular part of the French Revolution. Now, this statue, again, is a life-size bronze statue of Victor Noir, basically on the ground with his hat to his side after this happened. Now, the first thing people noticed, to be, I would probably notice this too, and it is quite noticeable when you see the pictures. The first thing people noticed about this statue is that this Jules, this guy, this artist, made Victor's manhood very alpha, we'll say. And I don't know if there was like metaphoric symbolism there like only real man men will stand up to the establishment i don't know i'm sure there was some sort of reasoning behind giving this statue such a big tallywacky i mean it's very noticeable it sticks out or maybe victor noir was known for this i don't i don't know this is where i need y'all's help like french people help me out was he known for this like did he was the was the word around town that he was um healthy we'll say he was healthy in that area um i don't know <laughs> but um yeah it's very very noticeable and so basically what happens today is that women will go to this statue and there's particular places that you can touch and rub to get pregnant they say that if you touch the right foot you'll get pregnant with one baby if you touch the left foot you'll get pregnant with twins now if you want a very 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 great intimate life we'll say no kids but just a great intimate life you kiss the mouth of this statue <laughs> and apparently if you want to find a husband you get on the statue if you know what i mean you you take part in in getting on the um the healthiness of his manhood basically and boy, oh boy, if you see the pictures of the statue, you can definitely tell that people have done this. And now they do say, too, that if it does work, if this works, and you end up pregnant within a year or in a very blissful, we'll say, relationship with a man or you get a husband, you're supposed to come back and leave flowers near his hat or in his hat. And so it's very obvious that this has worked for, for many, many women. Now, the interesting thing is in 2004, <laughs> y'all... In 2004, the French government was like, um, maybe y'all should stop molesting this statue. And so they put a fence around his statue so that people could not, women could not have relations, we'll say, with this statue. But the people got so upset about it that they took the, they took, they took the, the fence down. So y'all... I love this. Like I, I, and again, is it, is it his statue? Is that what's working? Is there magic there? Or is it because that women believe they're going to get pregnant or believe they're going to find a husband or believe they're going to have a great intimacy life that that's why it works. I don't know. Does it really matter how it works or just that it works? You know, um, no harm, no foul. Right. I, I don't think that this is, destroying a, a grave if it's for positive things like if people are coming and doing this with gratitude for a better life i don't think that that's really defaming the grave if that makes sense you guys might have a different opinion let me know in the comment section below but i just think that this is such a fantastic story and again i'm really curious as to why this particular person victor noir who lived a very short life became associated with infertility in modern times.
How did that happen? That's where I'm a little bit lost still. And again, I don't speak French. So let me know if you know more to the story. Please put it in the comment section below. But what do you guys think? I do have to say, I, I do, I do have to say, next time I'm in Paris, I will definitely be visiting this dude's grave. And I just might have to kiss his mouth. I just might. I'm not going to be tapping his feet. But I just might have to kiss his mouth. So, um, so why not, right? Why not? Stranger things have happened. So let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. And please let me know if you want me to do more stories around the Pierre Lachey Cemetery. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. That does help this uh channel out it helps with the algorithms make sure to comment because that does help push these videos out and hopefully this was a fun one for you guys and i cannot wait to hear your opinions down below